I don't hear any. If you have your Bibles, feel free to read to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 26. You find it, say amen. Amen. If you pick the paper there, you can turn over one page or so. Proverbs 24. I love Proverbs. Book of Wisdom. January, I began to preach on Sunday afternoons. The book of James, which has been referred to as the New Testament book of Proverbs. So I'm looking forward to that. Anybody in here need wisdom today? Amen. Listen to what Philippians 2, verse 12 says. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In the Greek text, the word, the word, the phrase work out means to be. To is the idea of exercise. How many of y'all like exercise? <laughs> uh, that's what I thought. <laughs> Just from the two of us that like exercise. Did you know that in your salvation, you don't work for salvation, salvation is provided by God. It's uh, we receive eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. It is by faith, by grace we're saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. You don't do religious things or do be part of a religion for salvation. Salvation is a personal encounter with God, to where God, by his grace, draws you to him. He confronts your sins and, and confronts our separation from God. and gives us the grace to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and to receive him. And therefore becoming and having the right to be called the children of God. Amen. Amen. Salvation's done by God. But now Paul writes that we are to work out, build up our salvation in fear and trembling. The problem in the church today, in the modern church today, is that we have a lot of spiritual, lazy children. Mm. So today I want to preach on spiritual laziness. How many of y'all enjoy Thanksgiving because you can sit around with family and do that? Come on now. That's what you don't be lying to in the house of God. We all enjoy that. I had my son here this week, and one of the things that I got to do is sit around and watch ball games with him. And, and there's nothing that can improve your life by watching somebody else play a game. So, so it's not that I'm getting anything out of it other than spending time with my son. But can I be honest with y'all and tell you, Brother Sam sometimes likes to just sit down and do that. I just like to sit down and do that. Now, unfortunately, many times we allow that attitude to enter into our walk with Jesus. Since Jesus has done everything and he's supplied salvation by dying on the cross and he supplied everything and through the Holy Spirit he's empowered us and, and he's given us salvation. Since he's done all the work, we think our jobs are done. We just want to live here on earth just relaxing until God calls us home. So unfortunately that's unscriptural. It's unbiblical. Matter of fact, the book of Proverbs talks and warns us and teaches us the danger of allowing our life to become spiritually lazy. Proverbs chapter 26. Uh, we're going to begin reading in verse number 13. Describes the lazy man. Would you stand with me and I'm ready to read the reading of God's holy and powerful and inner living word? So, Proverbs 26, verse 13. The lazy man says, There is a line in the road. A fierce line is in the street as a door turns on its hinges. So does the lazy man on his bed. The lazy man buries his hand in the boat. It wearies him to bring it back to his mouth. The lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who answer sensibly. Father, we come to you today grateful and thankful for this time and for this uh, sermon. It's very timely uh, for our lives, Father, as we're about to enter into the holiday season. And 
so many times we put emphasis on the holidays, and friendships, and parties, and, and family. And Father, sometimes we put our walk with you on the back burner. Father, that's very dangerous. And so, Father, I pray today you would speak to our hearts. And if there's any wickedness, Father, if there's any sin, would you confront us and would you humble us and bring us to confession and repentance? Father, we love you. We're so grateful for this time together and for this work. Speak now and guide us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Proverbs 26, verse 13 through 16, the Bible gives us the biblical description of a spiritual, lazy person. But before I get that to you, let me tell you what Webster's Dictionary defines laziness is. An unwillingness to work. Unwillingness to work. Mm, sluggish. <laughs> sluggish. Now, the Bible is going to outline for us, and God's going to give us great detail of a spiritual lazy man. Beginning in verse 13, verse 13, look what he said. Verse 13, the lazy man says, There is a lion in the road, a fierce lion in the street. A lazy man, first of all, is a man who gives all talk and no action. All talk and no action. Especially when it comes to, listen, spiritual warfare. He gives us an illustration here. He says, the lazy man goes out in the street and, and there in the street is a lion. And can I remind you that the Bible says that the Satan is like a lion seeking whom he may devour. He roars like a lion. He, he is used in an in illustration as a lion. Why? Because lions are fierce. Hundreds. They are intimidating animals. If there was a lion come through our hallway right now, you're not going to run up to him like a little kitty cat and say, Come on, kitty. Let me love on you. You might be lunch. Look what the Bible says about the lazy man. The lazy man there, he recognizes the danger. Please hear me. He recognizes the danger. There's a lion there. There's a lion at the street. There's something there that can destroy my life. Yet I won't take any action to defeat the enemy. To overcome. You know what he's doing? He's all talking. and he's no action. Y'all have met anybody like that. Somebody that can recognize problems, but they don't. <laughs> They're never part of the solution. They're always getting somebody else to come up with the solution, but they can recognize the problem. Amen. Here in America, every one of us can stand back and look at everything that's going on in America today, and we can point the finger and we can nail and say, This is wrong, and that is wrong, and this is why America's in such trouble. We're all talk and no action. Especially in the realm of spiritual warfare. Have you ever met anybody that you've watched their life and you've observed their life and you can see that the decisions and choices they were making for life were leading them down the road of destruction? And I'm talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm not talking about lost people. Lost people are hopeless without Christ. They're already in the wrong spot. I'm talking about brothers and sisters in Christ, people that you know, that you love, and you look at them and observe their life, and you begin watching them making one decision after another that's wrong, and it's heading toward the lion. And all they're doing is crying out, somebody help me, somebody take care of this lion. Now look up here for a second, let me tell you. Sometimes the lines that God allows to come in your path is for you to defeat. Reminds me of King David. You remember the little King David, the little shepherd boy before he became king? The Bible says that he got his training for kingship while he was being a shepherd. You know what David had to struggle with one time? Was a lion <laughs> that was endangering the flock. And when you're out there and it's just you and God and you're a teenage boy and it's just you and Jesus, he didn't stand up on that rock and say, there's one. 
There's a lion. Somebody get the lion. David, man of faith, man after God's own heart, that sang songs about God, wrote songs and songs about God, took action. He saw the danger and he took action. Look up here, brother. I'm going to say something. Some of y'all are having trouble at home and difficulties at home because the line is in your home and you're lazy. You're not trying to pray it out. You're not trying to preach it out. You're not trying to take uh, captivity of it. You're just standing there saying, There's a lion. There's a lion. There's a lion. <laughs> Y'all right? Then he called the Lord of Sam and said, Come get the lion. Then I called Brother Grant and tell him to go take the line out. And now we got Ross and he'll take the line out. Ladies, when it comes to spiritual matters, we just finished a in-depth look at the spiritual armor of God. And one of the things you have to do is put it on. We're in war. We're at war with the enemy. And yet we still have Christians being destroyed. Their lives are being influenced by the world and their flesh. They're being destroyed because there's a lion out there. And they recognize it. They see it. But they're just too lazy to put on the arm. Lazy man or lazy woman is all talk and no action. Number two. The lazy man depends on others to take care of his needs. Look what it says in verse 14. As a door turns on its hinges, so does the lazy man on his bed. Hmm. Does that door need help to function? Let's see if this door opens. Open sesame! The door didn't open it. Can I think that door open? Can you think that door open? That door is a functional part of life. It sits on hinges. And those hinges operate and will allow the door to function properly. But it takes somebody walking over to that door, putting their hand on the door, and opening the door. Or closing the door. I love the Bible. The Bible's real. Amen? Amen. It's a lie. He says that the door turns on the hinges, so the lazy man on his bed. He just laying in the bed, flying, flipping from one side to the other. Have y'all, any, anybody in here stayed in bed too long? You ever been sleeping, staying in bed too long? Doesn't it, after a while, begin to get uncomfortable? What did you start doing? Flipping and flying. Or take another sleeping pill. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Some of y'all have to be careful, y'all. Literal. Well, some say take another sleeping pill. Don't do that. Watch this. A lazy man depends on others to take care of his needs. All they're going to do is lay him in bed. Even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's unproductive, all they're going to do is just lay around. You know what this verse is speaking of? It is the man or the woman that has no intimate personal knowledge of God. They're not receiving revelation from God. Their experiences with God are based off the experiences of others. Wow. You know what lazy people don't have with God? Direction. Look up here. Those things are trying to be kind this morning, but I want you to let's end the year with the good help of God. Uh, there's some of you that you don't know what God wants for your life because you're too lazy to search the scripture and find out what God wants you to do. You're too lazy to get on your knees and seek God with all diligence and pray and ask God, God, give me a word. I'm tired of living here on earth like a lazy man in the bed, flipping and flopping. It's uncomfortable, God. I don't have any sense of direction. I don't have any purpose in life. I, it's just as though I'm in this bed and all I can do is stay in the bed. <coughs> Here's what the Bible says. Seek God, he shall be found. Did you hear that? Seek God, and he shall be found. 
If you really want to know what the direction and purpose in your life and what God has saved you for and where God wants to use you and how God wants to use you and why your life matters and whose life you can impact for the kingdom of God, then you get busy searching the scriptures, praying and asking God, give me reason, give me understanding, give me the desire of my heart. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. You don't have to flip and flop in life and wander around and, and have no purpose and direction. God has saved you for a reason. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians, it says he places you in a body for a specific reason. And it's not so you can sit on the pew and roll over every once in a while. <laughs> Y'all, they give me amen. Y'all not helping me on this. Could be that we've allowed our lives to get lazy in our spiritual walk with God. We've lost our sense of direction. We've lost purpose with God. We don't know what God is up to. We're always running around listening to what God's doing in other fellow's life. Let's have a testimony my brother says, so I'm here, everybody talking about what Jesus does for them because he's not done anything for me. The other night on Sunday night, it was a good Sunday night. We do little weird things around here. As a couple of Sunday nights ago, we, we, we talked about being more intentional with our witness this year. And so I made everybody go to somebody in this church they have never shared their story with. And for 30 minutes, I listened to people go to each other and talk about their lives and where they were before Christ and how they met Christ and what Christ is up to now. Man, there's nothing sweeter to a pastor. And here's people talking about what God's doing now. It's great you know where you were before you got saved. And it's great you know you are to know how you got saved. But that's not the end of the story. It's what God does from the moment you get saved till He takes you home. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, spiritual ways of people don't know what God's up to. They don't know what God wants their life to do. They're always looking for somebody else to help them out. Turn the door now. Swing open the door. Shut the door. Because I have no clue what God is up to. Depending on other people. I tell folks all the time, you think you, how do you think I got any Jesus that you don't have? You think I if you can't understand the scriptures and comprehend the scriptures like I do? Sure you can. You got the same Holy Ghost. You got the same scripture. But see, you always know, seem confident that you know where you're going and what direction you're in and all that. Even when I'm doing the wrong thing, I know that I'm doing the wrong thing. <laughs> and I don't need people to tell me. My God will tell me. Y'all all right. We just get lazy, though. Like a door on a hinge. Just gonna sit there and somebody else does something. When you ought to be taking your relationship with Jesus, you ought to be working out your salvation. Number three. Lazy man will not put much effort in. Look at verse 15. Boy, this says a lot, doesn't it? The lazy man buries his head in the bow. Listen to what it says. It wearies him to bring it back to his mouth. Oh, anybody here get spiritually lazy in your disciplines with God, fasting, prayer, Bible studies? Do you know that that's who you God's describing right there? Look here, watch this. Bread of life. Bread of life. You agree with that? What you might say there? Bread. Now, look, every morning God's giving you sweet manna from heaven right here. It's right here waiting on you. I mean, it comes down from heaven. God's got a word for you today. God's got a sweet, sweet manner for you today. And all God does is ask you to do what he asked the nation of Israel to do. I'm going to send down the sweet manner. All you've got to do is get up in the morning, or in the morning, go out there and gather it up and bring it back in. You're going to have nothing to sustain, sustain you to do that. Now, does that sound like too much? Here's our prayer. Here's our Bible. I can't even lift my hand. 
Y'all, yeah, we ain't spring with that. Come here, man. It means it's a broken mouth. Oh, you get a pretty good man. I cheer it up. Man, you're smart, don't you? <laughs> Y'all right? I used to preach along, but that was good. Right? Yeah, you got to be up here. Up here, up here, up here. You don't spoon things. Brother Sam, it's your job to cook, cook every Sunday, have it prepared. And I bring my little self down, sit myself in my high chair, my little spot in the pew. And now you feed us. <clears throat> and the reason I put that spit right in there is because sometimes I can see some of y'all when I start preaching. But like right now, preaching on your spiritual agents, you don't want you that as far as it is. That don't taste good. <clears throat> I like asparagus. <laughs> Spinach. That's nasty. I don't want that. I I like broccoli. Don't say that. Some people really get mad when you say broccoli. They like it broccoli. That's me. We just want to be tame. Amen. 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 I don't know what she is. So we all this morning, I'm giving you these potatoes. You just don't like the way it's prepared. <laughs> oh, you got your head stuck in the boat, don't you? Somebody need to pull your head up. It, you know what churches do? Churches offer Bible studies. We offer Sunday school. We get biblical preachers and teachers. We provide every substance and every everything you need to feed you. But you know what the problem is? That's still not enough. You've got to learn how to feed yourself and your body. Yeah. To build you up. To have the energy. To have the strength. The faith. Everything you need. You've got to go home and take your bread of life. Get a word for you. Have something ready for what you're going to deal with this week. The problems. The lines out there. you got to be ready. you got to be I know y'all not gonna believe it, but some of us are malnutrition when it comes to the bread of life. But we need somebody else to have that word in for us. Give it to us. Because we just don't know how to take our hands and lift up the bread to ourselves, prepare the meat for ourselves. Y'all all right. Just describing the lazy man for you. And I'm just saying it right here in the text. I'm going to show you the next day. All right, a lazy man is all talk, no action. He depends on others to take care of his needs. He do not put in much effort or she. And look at the fourth thing. A lazy man believes he's always right. Verse 16. What's that? The lazy man is wiser in his own eyes. Then seven men who answer. <coughs> now, y'all know the number seven stands for completion, perfection. So, when God uses the number here, He's talking about I'm going to send seven sensible, which means reasoning, understanding men. And they're going to confront this one lazy man. And the lazy man still thinks he knows more than the seven sensible. You ever walk up to somebody and try to help a lazy man? And, and you come up to them and they start whining, complaining about, I don't have money to do this and I don't have money to do that. And then you come up to them and you say something like this, well, if you didn't have all the money spent on cigarettes, you could have money. <laughs> well, I say, I just think some of y'all spend big time. <laughs> you get a preacher talking on time. That's what like, I can't afford them. Well, this one, Daniel, check me and see what you afford me to do. All that HBO you got coming in your house, CNN to the max, pay $100 a month, bring CNN to your house. You pipe it in the line. Oh, somebody should have gave me an amen. <laughs> that means I'm in the right spot. I'm clearing me off the path now, y'all, right? 
so and so so you don't want it you don't want to take no action you don't want to do nothing about all this stuff and so you just want to come and whine and complain I ain't got money I can't do nothing for God I can't do nothing God can't do nothing God I say I'm just so I'm just so I get the money and the dollar ain't gonna bother me. I started got the window to go down and use another thing. Pull it in the drive through. <laughs> mm. God sends sinful people to you, tells you what's what's going on. And lazy people spiritually, lazy people spiritually, when you confront them with sensibility and and understanding and reason, biblical reasoning. Here, here's the thing. They say things like this. Don't judge me. Not your place to judge me. Not your place to criticize me. You don't like me. You brought up my sin. <laughs> you all right. Y'all look at me. We put a big screen TV up there for Pete to look at. I'm going to put a big mirror up here for y'all to look at you <laughs> when I'm preaching. Amen. Let you see how well we see this message is. God runs up the street and says, listen to this, Proverbs 27 3. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Wow. By the way, people that are go getters that get after things, let me tell you what they know. They know that. Because they're so active and they're involved and they're building and they're constructing, they know every once in a while they're going to do something the wrong way and it's going to make their job worse. And so, a, a hard working, sensible man, when a sensible man comes to him and says, That's the wrong way to do it, he, he don't criticize and he don't say, Don't judge me. He welcomes the rebuke and says, Well, tell me how to do it better, more efficient, faster, make my job easier. I don't know if a hardworking man in here or a hardworking woman that I look at that knows that they're going to make mistakes because if you work hard enough and you work long enough, you're going to make a bad decision, bad choice. But you know what you welcome? You welcome somebody to come up and say, hey, that's the wrong way to go about that. Hey, I would do it this way. And as you look at it sensibly, you know what you do? You agree with them. And you thank them for correcting. So you don't keep making the mistake over with again and again. Amen. Amen. Well, let me tell you, a lazy person don't look that way. Lazy person thinks they're always right and their way is the only way, the best way. Why? Because anything else is going to require a little action. I'm saying, I'll never come to church except when I feel it. <laughs> I'll only read my Bible and pray when I got a crisis. My relationship with Jesus is just found the way it is. Y'all all right? You can both take that approach. According to Proverbs 27, my women, open rebuke is better than love. Now, both say, what if I stay late? Hmm, glad you asked. Turn over now to Proverbs chapter 24. Hmm. By the way, King Solomon's right. Lies as man, the scripture says. Matter of fact, when God asked him, you have anything you want, what do you ask for? So I think he knows what he's talking about. In chapter 24, beginning in verse 30, he describes one about the house of a man or woman that remains spiritually lazy. Can you stay spiritually lazy and still be saved? Yeah. Y'all hear that? Some of y'all just shouted, hallelujah, inside. <laughs> you couldn't do it with your lip because you can't lift up your head out of the bottom, sure. Man, I'm be safe and still be lazy. Uh huh. Why well, don't you take a look at your life now? Because Solomon recognized the life. Look what he says in verse 30. I went by the field of the lazy man, and by the vineyard of the man, the boy of understanding. There it was. All overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little folding of the hands to rest. 
so shall your poverty come like a problem, and your needs like an only man. So Solomon described to us the biblical consequences of a spiritual lazy life. First of all, your life gets overrun. Look at verse 31. He said, and there it was, overgrown with thorns. Hmm. The phrase, all grown over with thorns, the word thorns in the Hebrew means jealousy. Can I ask you a question? What makes our God jealous? Do you know? Your decision and my decision to be influenced by sin or to be influenced by the world. And so when we live spiritually lazy, we can expect our, our lives to be overrun with worldly and sinful influence. This is what James 4, 4 said. He says, you adulterers and adulterers, know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. The word enmity means opposition. And so he goes by the house, and there's his field, there's his vineyard. It's supposed to be fruitful. It's supposed to be blessed. And yet, when he gets there, it's all grown up. And he describes it as thorns and nettles. The word nettles in the Hebrew means prickly, pointed, a thorny weed. And so here's their life. It is now being influenced instead of by the Spirit of God, the power of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, everything that God is in the person of Jesus Christ, which is the fruitful life. It is the life that is full of milk and honey and abundance and blessing. Can I have that name? That's where you're supposed to. When people look at your field and look at your house, it's supposed to be cleared off. And they ought to be able to distinguish and tell what you look like. You ever drawn by an old farmhouse or something that's been all grown up? I remember as a boy living up in her. They, they used to be some fine farms and, and, and ranches up there. People growing cows and all. And when you drive, you'd say, there's Mr. Mr. Tanner's farm and, and there's Mr. Jones' cow field out there. You, you knew his farms. They were always immaculate. They were, the fields were kept clean. You could tell what they were planting. You drive by and say, man, they plant soybeans this year. Man, he planted wheat this year. He plant, you'd be able to recognize the fruit. You have to drive by there and say, well, what was Mr. Tanner planting this year? Because his field was always clean and I don't know what Solomon says. I drove by the house of a lazy man. Somebody didn't take care of the spiritual walk the way they're supposed to. They didn't work out their salvation with fear and trembling. They thought they could just live anywhere they wanted to live here on earth. They allowed the world to continue to influence on the thorns. They continued to let the nettles continue to just, and all of a sudden just grows up. You ever been out hunting? Some of you guys ever been out hunting and you run into a briar patch? And you get turned around in that broad patch trying to get out, and next thing you know, you there's bars everywhere. Rabbit jumps up. <laughs> in my case, the biggest deer I've ever seen in my life runs right through that. I, I can't even get my gun up because I got all them. Oh. Listen, brothers. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in the church today, there's too many homes that are unrecognizable as being holy, righteous. Christ like home because it's grown up with worldly influence and sin. We drive by your house, your house looks like everybody else's house. Your field looks like everybody else's field. We can't determine what you say and you're not saying. We can't determine whether you walk with God, you don't walk with God. There is no boundaries, there is no limitations, there is no spiritual fruit produced because of your legacy. And you go to the sower, but you go to John and talk about the vine and the vineyard and the branches. What did God say when he had to start pruning your branches? It did. He got to sneak you to cut them off. Some of y'all, God, you think a bush hog? <laughs> Bulldozer. Y'all all right? 
And maybe the Holy Ghost is doing that this morning. I hope He's starting to clear your field where there used to be fruits of righteousness. There used to be fruits of love and joy and peace and, and, and goodness and kindness and generosity. All the things that are listed in the book of Galatians as the fruit of the Spirit. There was evidence once that those things were there, but you become so spiritual lazy. And now the thorns and the nettles is growing up around us. And we no longer tell the difference. It gets all around I don't know about y'all, but I got a three quarter of an acre of lot. That's not big. That's not a lot of land. Big. Boy, it's more than Brother Sam can keep up there. Y'all know what I'm talking about? When you drive by, by my house, I want you to know hey, that's old Brother Sam, the preacher. Got the grass cut, leaves right, cut back the trees, and the trees start running over. And I hate them vines that grow in the above tree. Got them big old thorns on them. And and before you know it, man, you just weed eat one of them and you got vines everywhere. And, and, and this year, that's a, just, it's just, if you don't stay on top of it, if you don't stay on top of it, it don't take long. It'll just overcome. You'll be standing there looking, where do I start? Unfortunately for us, I think that there's so many Christians that their lives are overrun by the influence of the world, overrun by the sin of the world, and they're just consumed with it. They're entrapped by it. They just don't know where to begin. Then they'll say something like this. You ever heard a Christian say this? Y'all raise your hand. Everybody get the phone. I'm going to sleep. I'm circling up for a moment. Just a bit. Watch this. You ever heard a Christian say this? Being a Christian is hard. Come on now. You better hear that. Yeah. Oh, my head. Raise your hand. Let me know who y'all are. You yeah. Hey, how many of y'all have ever said that? Come on, raise your hand. Don't lie, bro. Being a Christian is hard. I've heard people tell me, Brother Gary, they were better off being a lost man. <laughs> I'm serious. You mean it's easier to just do nothing spiritually and go to hell? Because in salvation, there's work to be done. Hmm. Well, Sam, can I stay spiritual with you? You should be. Just know that your life gets overran by worldly influence and sin. Number two, it gets overran by the enemy. Look what he says. Hey, look at what it says here in verse number 30. When he said, There it was, overgrown with thorns, and suffers was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. Mm. Mm. Watch this. When I got saved, I received the seal of the Holy Ghost in my life. That seal can't be broken by anybody to That's right. I'm, I'm telling you, he's saying, y'all are. Right. And watch his back get spiritually lazy. Not only is my life going to get overrun with worldly influence and sinful influence, it's going to get overrun by the enemy. And that, God, when God saved you, he has not only protected your soul for eternity. See, here's the thing the devil knows he can't touch your soul because now it's been given to God. Y'all right? He can't touch your soul, but he sure can raise, <laughs> raise habit on your life down here. Mm -hmm. So you know what he does? He'll take that. He'll say, I'll bring confusion, fear, and doubt. I'll bring all that. And the only way he can touch your life is for you become spiritually lazy to the point that your walls, that hedge of protection that God has placed around you because you belong to him. See, he laid that first stone the day I got saved, September 22nd, 1980. 1987. Now watch it. That day I got saved on that Thursday, he laid the cornerstone of Jesus. <clears throat> now let's fast forward 26 years later. By faith and obedience and working with God in my salvation, every step of obedience and faith that I've shown God, he's laid another brick. He's laid another rock. <clears throat> And man, I'm telling you what, he's laid some big rocks on my wall. Y'all all right? I mean, he's building that wall up. Let me tell you how, how big my, let me tell you how vast my wall is. You ready? This is good. My wall don't just cover my life, it covers my wife's life. I got four young ones, five young ones, really. 
and he's trying to build a wall around me. Y'all all right, this is better preaching than y'all. I'm telling you, this is good stuff. I mean, 26 years I've been walking by faith and believing in Jesus Christ and allowing him to confront the sin in my life, clear my field, clear my life, plant his crop in my life, plant, plant his seed, raise up those things in my life, and every step of obedience, every action that I take with Jesus Christ in my salvation, he lets him up. And he's the lawyer. Which means the devil can come and punch on it, kick on it, do everything he wants to do to it, and he can't do anything to knock it down. But I'm telling you, most folks saying, I'm telling you, trying to help your mind. Listen to me. You become spiritual lazy, a lot of the rocks get stopped. You're not benefiting from the power of the blood, the more it gets weak. And it's not his fault, it's your fault. Now the enemy comes, and you don't watch your wall crumbles. Y'all right? It's all blown up. We can't see no fruit. There ain't no power. Man, the wall's not even finished. Your children's a mess. Your grandchildren's a mess. Everybody's a mess. Y'all right? My son said, here today, I got a daughter in Georgia. And I'm telling you, by the grace of God, the one thing God never has allowed me to even, to even contemplate is the fear that something's going to happen to them. You want to know why? I'm just going to keep my faith. Whether they do or not, they can decide not to let God build their walls. He don't mind. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm going to keep laying brick by brick by faith. The Bible says, raise up the child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart. So I don't know what they're doing out there in these battle as long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to keep building and keep plowing ground. Y'all all right. That's good stuff. But now if you're lazy, you wait on somebody else to be your battle. You wait on somebody to come in your yard and clean the field. Y'all all right? Hmm. The enemy come. Your wall that should be there, it should be solid. It should be able to, you know, hey, I look, can I can't leave this wall thing there. It's too good. You remember what Job, you remember when Satan came and had permission to put with Job? You remember what he told God? Hey, I can't touch him. You got a thorn. You got a hedge of protection around him. I like to think that's what the devil hears every time he comes to try to deal with him. He said, hey, I want to mess with old Sam, but every time I, I man, I can't do anything because of that wall you built around me. Mm, watch this. Not only will your life be influenced. By the thorn, <coughs> metals, and the enemy. Mm. They can come down. In verse 33, it says, We're asleep, we're asleep, we're asleep, we're asleep, we're asleep, we're asleep, So shall your poverty come like a power, and your need like an army. The scripture refers to here <coughs> that we become spiritually idle. It means that we. It says when you a little sleep, a little slumber, it means to take rest, it means to lie down. Here's what it means. Look up here. It means just to give up and die. You know what Solomon's saying? I went by this house. The house should have been blessed of the Lord. It should have had the fruit of the Lord. It should have had the power of the Lord. It should have had strong walls. It should have had multiple crops growing out there. But I, I went by there that thing. The walls was coming down. It was overran by the influences. And I walked in and I looked in the window. And the man, the woman that should have been full of life, was just laying there giving up. And becoming like. Hopeless, discouraged, depressed. Y'all know any Christians that ever go that way? 
pretty good chance that idleness is a result of laziness. I said pretty good chance. They might be some mental things and they might make some emotional things. But I'm telling you, the Bible says Jesus come to give us life. He says in that verse, now we always love to quote John 10, 10, but you got to back up and understand what it says. The lion comes. The Satan comes to see, to, to destroy, to steal, and to kill. He, everything he mentions about the lion, the Satan, that evil one, is how to destroy your life. But then, then in John 10, 10, he says that, but I come. Now I'm going to give you life and give it to you more abundantly, which means beyond any measure com comprehensive to our mind. God's just not going to give you a little life. He wants to give you everything, anything and everything abundantly more than you can ever. You can't put a measurement on that. Of how much God wants to live in you. I'm first saying I'm doing it. I'm telling you, Holy Ghost saying I'm doing it. Listen to me. Laziness leads to a life overrated. And we're going to talk about what your overrated in the world is. It leads to a life of confidence. It'll bring death. It will bring the spiritual death. Yeah, but Brother Sam, you done told me that it won't change my position in salvation. No, it won't change your position, but it changes your relationship. Did you get that? It doesn't change your position. Once saved, I believe once saved, I always saved. You get Jesus, you get salvation through Jesus. I don't believe you can lose it. I don't believe that he's going to take it away from you and throw it away. I, that just goes everything against what I know about my God. But I'm telling you this, your spiritual laziness will lead to a dead relationship between you and Jesus. <laughs> You'll become a spiritual. You'll fall into the hand of a little slumber, a little sleep, you become soft or lazy. You ever watch the sloth? It is painful to watch a sloth. <laughs> the National Geographic Channel showed a sloth one time for about 55 seconds. It's all I could do to just not shoot the TV. <laughs> Y'all are. I mean, they lay in that tree and for 50 seconds they watch that thing lay down and all of a sudden you start moving. Uh -huh. Really? <laughs> you know what I think God allows and created the small form is to show us what we look like spiritually. Y'all yeah. are right. I mean, what purpose do they serve? I can you eat them? Anybody know, can you have a small burger? <laughs> I don't know. Does anybody, I mean, can you take their fur and do anything with it? I don't know. Can you get a small coat? I don't know. What is their purpose in life? I mean, you know, it's not to observe them and get any joy. My goodness, that drives me. I'd be like, for well, God's sakes, move. <laughs> well, then I just want to shoot just to see if it move any faster. <laughs> I bless God in my heart, and it's a spiritual picture. You know why? Because you know what animal God uses to describe a spiritual lazy person? YouTube and watch it. God bless you if you can. Now listen, look at this. I said a lot this morning, but here's can I can we hit rubber on the road and stuff? Let's all be Truth It's really to allow the It can happen to you. It really can. It can happen to you. And you can have great intentions, great motivation, and say, man, I've never let that happen to you in my life. I've never ever become spiritual lazy. I love reading scripture. I love going to Sunday school. I love teaching. Man, I love it so much that I do it Monday through Saturday at my house, in my car, and listen to the gospel. Me, man, I'm fired up about Jesus. I, 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 man, I can't get enough, nothing, nothing. Man, I got to have more, more, more. Let's I mean, just go get her to Jesus. Amen? Amen. 
I've known many women like that. You know what we call them? They're on fire. Don't we love you? They're on fire, man. I mean, they just got it going on. You ever seen somebody on fire and something start happening to them and it doesn't? Results are spiritual. Now, please hear me. I'm going to say this again. You don't work for your salvation. God will not say. Please, everybody hear this. Don't go out here and say, Brother Sam, I'm going to attend church just so I can show everybody I'm saved. No, I don't attend church to show anybody I'm saved. I attend church because that's what I want to do, and that's what I want to do. I mean, I'm here because I want to be. I'm going to preach because I want to preach. I, I like being around God's people. I, I love being around God. I look forward to opportunities to be around y'all. And when I'm not around y'all, I find other Christians to be around Monday through Saturday. I can't be around you. I love Jesus and love all with Jesus. Can I be honest and truthful? And tell them don't be spiritually bad. Do I just like the fact that Jesus has done all the work and that I can just put in a little bit of a long way? Y'all right? When I feel like it. When I might benefit from it. Y'all don't tell me. Need something, then I get after it. This spiritual laziness is a dangerous thing for a child. <coughs> I'm looking at men and women right here, right now. Some of y'all have already put in your 40 and 50 years and you retire. Amen. That's what retirement is reward for not killing the people you work with and drive you crazy. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. It's a glorious thing to be rewarded by retirement. But hey, let me tell you something. You don't get to retire with Jesus. He don't have a retirement plan. You're going to live with him for eternity. Y'all right? Which means, when you get saved, you start that journey. And if he allows you to live on this earth for 100 years, and you get saved at 20, your next 80 years, is to live here just like you plan on living when you get there. And you've got to get active. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about my son. He's going to think, Daddy, you're just talking about me, but I'm proud of him. He's got good work ethic. You know where he got his work ethic? For me and his mom. You know where we got our work ethic? She got her from her mom and daddy. I got mine from my mom and daddy. You know where they got there? From their grandparents. I mean, we don't believe in laziness in our house. You can ask my two girls, their biggest conflict with me is the fact that when they want to get lazy, daddy gets hot. Y'all right? How many of y'all get mad at lazy people? Come on now, we see your hands. Come on now, lay off. Oh, the woman's waving at me. He's got a little hot. Let's drop in lazy folks. Amen. Man, we don't need, you know what the Bible says a lazy man ought not even eat. We ain't responsible to take care of lazy folks if they don't want to work. Isn't that amazing? Hey, can we use that in our spiritual walk as well? Woo! Done made some of y'all mad. That ain't that. If we believe that scripture, a lazy man ought not eat. Then spiritually, you can't be lazy either. You ought not be satisfied with it. Or even entertain it in your mind. You ought to be grateful for the opportunity to get up and pray every day and pray all through the day. And you ought to be grateful for the opportunity to serve your master and, and to be part and say, well, I get tired. You know what? You get tired of your job too, don't you? But you keep pushing through, don't you? Boss can call and say, I need you to work 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, man. You're right there. I got to do You might complain and moan a little bit, but you know what you're going to do? You're going to put 12, 14 hours in. And all you're going to get is money. When you put in to Jesus, you get all of him. You put 10 minutes in, don't expect more than 10 minutes out. You're all right. I'm, I'm late. I want you to get this this morning. Spiritual laziness is overrunning the church. 
We hire staff and we say staff do. We want everybody to be leaders and we want the leaders to do it. But it takes all of us working in our salvation to make a successful church. A changed community. A different state. A different country. If it's easy, we let the Methodists do it, amen? <laughs> Just kidding, that's on the internet. I didn't think that. <laughs> 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 Somebody about this gonna say that and we'll start getting emails. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm getting laid up. Let me answer the question. How's your workout program with Jesus? <clears throat> How much you put in? You put me in, you, you exercise me, Jesus, you're going to become a powerful man and woman of faith. I know my God. And you put me in, the more you put in, he's going to pour out. More's coming out. I mean, it, it's a natural thing. Uh, you you want to talk about these guys getting pumped up and, and, and steroids? Let me tell you, you get full of Jesus working in you, you're talking about a muscle. You, mm, you got it. Y'all right? I mean, you just can't do it, strength, power, everything is that for you. Ain't that matter if the coming, you ain't scared of no line, you punch that line in the mouth. <laughs> you don't need no some people to come get you. You run out there and Kyle Pell and not be much walking around. Y'all right? Yeah. I just believe that stuff. You ain't hollering at somebody, it's just you and Jesus. You go handle things. You don't need nobody. <laughs> the spiritual ways you've got, here's how you fix it. Here's the great man. Y'all ready? Here's the hope. Confess your sin. Confess that God, I've been a little lazy lately. A little bolder in the hands, a little slower. Haven't been working at it the way I ought to. Wait on somebody else, food, feed me, do all that stuff for me. This is being you. Here's the great thing about our God. He'll forgive you. And he'll forgive you. Amen? Amen. But you have to humble yourself and bow before you and say, Lord, I've been this. I'm going to make it better. Get back on that workout program with Jesus. It is about our folks. Father, thank you for this word. Father, I need, need to be reminded of it, Father. If you didn't speak to anybody else, you should have spoken to me. I'm grateful and thankful, Father. I pray now for your people, they be humble and obedient to whatever it is you tell them. <laughs> that starting right now, they begin to work out their salvation with fear and trouble. We love you and ask you to speak now in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, and our music begin to play. God spoke into your heart. You need to make a decision for him today. Maybe you're here and you need to give your life to Jesus. Maybe you're here today and this is the church that God's told you. You need to be a child. Maybe you're here and you're a child of God. And you know that you've been spiritual, lazy, and your life is about to get over it.